one. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my, I'm David Kelly. Uh, I'm the founder of the Atlas Society and longtime CEO, uh, and now one of its senior scholars. And I wanna welcome everyone to the 136th episode of our weekly series, The Atlas Society Asks. Um, I need to read this. Uh, the Atlas Society is a leading nonprofit organization uh, introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in creative ways. Uh, I wanna remind those of you watching us on Zoom, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube to use the comments section to type in any questions you have. We're not gonna be taking live questions now, but uh, your questions are always informative. Um, this session is part of a special series. The uh, Atlas Society Ask is uh, our uh, venue for interviewing many, many people. It started back in, I think, 2020 when our CEO, Jennifer Grossman, had the brilliant idea during the pandemic to um, do a lot of stuff online with interesting people. And so now Richard is a very interesting person. <laughs> and uh, right. So now, you know, we're doing the 136, uh, 136, yes, I can, it staggers my mind. Anyway, this uh, is one form of, of the Atlas Society Ask is scholars ask, scholars. Over the past few years, we've increased the uh, intellectual capital at the Atlas Society considerably. Um, our senior scholars now include professors uh, uh, Stephen Hicks, Jason Hill, uh, Richard Salzman, and myself. And today I'm delighted to spend an hour with talking with my very esteemed colleague and dear friend, Richard Salzman, about his intellectual development, his career, and his involvement with the objectivist movement. Uh, Richard is a professor at Duke University in the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, or PPE program, which we're going to talk about. Uh, he received his PhD from Duke. His books include, uh, uh, the most recent one is Where Have All the Capital Is Gone? You can see that on uh, Richard's uh, shelf behind right. Richard's a close-up. Um, and he's written uh, four other books uh, um, on the political economy of public debt, gold and liberty, the collapse of deposit insurance, um, and breaking the banks. Uh, he's also published numerous articles and spoken at many conferences. Uh, for the Atlas Society, he currently does two clubhouse sessions every month. Uh, he hosts a monthly Markets and Morals uh, webinar exploring interconnections um, between ethics, politics, economics, and markets. And uh, so with that introduction, um, let's get going. Uh, Richard, let me start by asking you just uh, a bit of your origin story. Um, Where did you grow up? I grew up in Hamilton, Massachusetts, which was named after Alexander Hamilton. So, oh, that's your... yeah. In a, yeah. Well, that's not the reason I got interested in Hamilton. That's a separate <laughs> issue. But, okay. but in the in the founding days, New England was very federalist, you know, and the anti-federalists, the Jeffersonians, were in this middle in the South. But, yeah. Uh, and and a six siblings in a Catholic family. So this is 1960s Massachusetts Catholic upbringing. But a great upbringing. Yeah, good. Well, there could be worse ones. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, you went to Bowdoin College. Uh, was right. that your interest in um, economics began? No. Well, began, yes. I went up there to get a pre-law degree. So I was totally interested in law. I was an arguer. I was a debater. I loved reading the law. And uh, so the first two years, I was law. And I was, and I specifically got interested in constitutional law. And there was just a fabulous professor up there, Richard Morgan, uh, and he was an absolute constitutional specialist and actually a conservative. I didn't realize until later. And uh, however, I, when we got to the 1930s, 
the case studies uh, really showed that the Supreme Court started stepping back and allowing massive intervention in the economy. And um, we, so we know all this in retrospect, but, and, and so when I realized it was due to the Great Depression, I got obsessed with ex- studying the Great Depression. So I started majoring in economics as well. I ended up with a double major. I majored in law and economics. But the economics part started with what the hell was the Great Depression? Apparently, it overthrows American principles of jurisprudence. So it's going to be a huge thing. And maybe economics is more powerful than politics Mm. and law. So anyway, that was the origin of uh, getting uh, both majors at Duke, at, uh, excuse me, at Bowdoin, which I graduated about 1981 or so. Right. And then you went into banking uh, as a career, not law. Right. Um, And I assume you used your uh, economic acumen to uh, work for about 20 years, right? Yes. Basically, from 1981 to the early 2000s, banking and or finance or investment consulting. Yeah, broadly finance uh, before I went into academia. And uh, interestingly, halfway through Bowdoin, I read um, Ayn Rand stuff. So you know, on my father's shelf, my father was a conservative, not an objectivist. But one summer when I was bored, I looked on his bookshelf and I found a book called Capitalism. And I just started reading it. And I literally thought it had to do with how factories were organized. I don't know why I thought that, but to, that's what capitalism was in my mind. Something having to do with economics. So I thought I was reading a pure economics book. I don't know why a kid would do that in the summer for no reason, but when I <laughs> opened it, my eyes were just completely open because it basically, if you remember, it opens with, this is not a book, uh, this is not a treatise on economics. It's got moral arguments and philosophical, and I was bowled over. I absolutely loved it. And um, that is one of the reasons, ultimately, believe it or not, I went into banking. It wasn't just that I was studying economics, and then within economics, I really found money in banking interesting because, you know, Friedman and others had said the central bank had caused the Great Depression. So I thought, wow, money and banking, I started drifting in that direction. But when I read uh, Francisco's money speech, that really motivated me in the sense of saying, this is not only an interesting field, but it's, uh, it's got moral implications. So that is literally, that is literally one of the reasons I went to Wall Street, not only to become good at finance and banking and lending, but I, ha- I had this love of the city. I had this love of, um, you know, Francisco's argument. I knew Ayn Rand was down in New York. So for every reason in the world, I wanted to go to New York. And this was, uh, so you were reading these works uh, yeah. in college. Yes, halfway through college. Wow, yeah. Starting and- in the sophomore year or so. Yeah, and then I would try out the arguments on the professors and they were just, oh, okay, this kid is an idiot. He's, you know, yeah. he's, trying, he's <laughs> drinking, he's this drinking the kool-aid <laughs> you're right been there <laughs> yeah. um so you um you were at you spent about 20 years in uh, banking and finance you were active as an intellectual I, I know your early books were written and published during that time and you right. you uh, just wrote many articles uh, right and um but what what got you? What moved you into academic life from after that career in banking? I whatever I did, I wanted the backstory, so to speak. I wanted the broader picture. So, for example, my first book was Breaking the Banks: Central Banking Problems and Free Banking Solutions. Now that came out of a uh, thesis that I was writing at NYU. So while I was in banking, I was getting my MBA. But when you think about an MBA, the MBA at the time was just to advance in the bank. I was at the Bank of New York, down on Wall Street. I wasn't yet thinking of an academic career, but I could see that I was interested in in doing research and giving talks and lectures. And the 1990 period was the SNL collapse. So it was a huge financial crisis. And my theme was central banking had done this, that it wasn't a fault of free markets or greed or all that kind of stuff. And it was public, to my amazement, was published by AIER, Mm. who I am now affiliated with. So a long story, you know, in 1988, I sent them the the manuscript and they liked it and published it. So I I got my first taste of, wow, people will publish some stuff that I write. That was actually done also under a Keynesian professor uh, at NYU. And he liked it, even though it was a critique of Keynesian economics and the manipulation of money and credit. And I was bringing in, I was bringing in Mises and Hayek and 
Greenspan. Right, yeah. I, I think that was the beginning of me realizing that I can work in the academic world. Here's a professor who disagrees with me, but agreeably, Paul Wachtell, I should name his name. Paul Wachtell, who, who, by the way, later, David, two decades later, when I was trying to get into Duke, uh, I, I looked for re references, you know, letters. And I called Paul Wachtell, who hadn't seen me in 18 years. 18 years. <laughs> said, Would you give me a letter of recommendation to do? He remembered me immediately, which is nice. He said, of course, yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so also you start learning, wow, if you're a gentleman and a scholar, um, you can develop long-term relationships with people. And it, it works out that way. So um, that's really how the first book came around. Golden Liberty was done about five years later, 1995. And I was on my way. But at the same time, I was affiliated with the Ayn Rand Institute. So they had me on their speakers bureau. And I would go around to campuses giving lectures. My first topics were on antitrust, uh, the, the evils uh -huh. of antitrust, subsequently our, uh, uh, S, um, talks on environmentalism, Right, And so I would do four or five campus lectures, you know, per uh, school season uh, in the, uh, the 90s. So there I also got a feel for being on campus, interacting with students, mm -hmm. in some cases getting hostility that the cancel culture was working even back then. But so anyway, that's just as the answer to the question of why was I edging toward academia? Because I was publishing and I realized, you know, I'm not just a banker. I'm a banker who wants to know why there are banking crises. Yeah, <laughs> how bank, you know, and how banking fits into the broader picture of capitalism and all that. So I, I think I was enormously benefited by the fact that then that things got really improved in the 1980s. So you and I have talked about this before, but the Reagan revolution and supply side economics and all that kind of stuff I totally got into. And it was reviving the American economy. And I'm down on Wall Street during all this time. And it's just a very exciting, invigorating time. And it looks like our ideas are winning. Plus my yeah. career. Plus, my career is improving. So, so uh, just for the audience, uh, you referred to uh, AIER. That's uh, the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, right. One of the organizations uh, promoting freedom um, today and, and for a long time. Um, yeah. So, um, what what you were um, in the banking industry. Uh, but also speaking uh, on the after ARI was started in, for their speakers bureau and writing, you know, other things. Yeah. Was there any tension with your banking employers with the banks? Uh, yes, sometimes, but mostly from the standpoint of uh, I would go to a campus and the ISO uh, that would be the International Socialist Organization, the Student Socialists, <laughs> would call up my bank and try to get me fired. So it wasn't that the bank said you can't speak, you know, you can moonlight and speak on campuses and stuff. I didn't have to get permission as long as I wasn't speaking on behalf of the bank. But after the Bank of New York, for example, I worked for Citicorp for three or four years. And one time I gave a talk in Cincinnati criticizing environmentalism. The title of the talk was Capitalism and the Environment, the Virtues of Exploitation. <laughs> so I was making <laughs> I was making a positive argument for, you know, rearranging the earth and in our image. And the ISO got so upset, I, they were throwing rotten tomatoes at me on stage, literally. And they called Citicorp. So I got back to New York later, and I was called up to the uh, C-suite and asked, what, what the hell happened in Cincinnati? <laughs> because they're calling for your ouster. What? And to their credit, the senior executives at Citicorp said, are you doing this on your own time? Yes. You're not invoking Citicorp on your... No. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's and some I, you know, I out there that have a little spine. Yes, I go back down the elevator, you know, holding my breath, not having to hold my breath anymore. I still had my job, but that was my first taste of cancel culture or the attempt at it. It was happening. Yeah. Back, it, people were being yelled off the stage back then in the '90s as well. So, Citicorp may have lost some customers uh, uh, among the socialists, but probably they were <laughs> right. Customers. Right, not an important <laughs> group, not an important constituency. Um. So um, you're currently teaching at Duke and yeah. in the uh, politics, uh, philosophy, politics and economics program. Could you tell us a little bit about PPE? Well, PPE, yeah, 
it's a wonderful thing from our standpoint, David, from the standpoint of philosophy matters and knowledge is integrated and we shouldn't be, you know, siloed off into siloed off myopically into various disciplines that don't talk to each other. So this is this did happen at the turn of the last century where poli sci went its own way and economics went its own way and even philosophy really went not only went its own way, went off the rails. Yeah. <laughs> But if we go back all the way to Adam Smith and the others, they talked about political economy. It was the principles of political economy. That was the name of all the textbooks. And uh, the feeling was at the end of the 1800s, well, uh, politics is not scientific and economics can be. And so we should split the two. Um, long story short, by the mid 80s, um, in America at least, but this is the trend that happened earlier in Britain, uh, there was a group of people who said, we need to bring back political economy. And at Oxford, of all places, in Britain in the 19, early 1920s, they came up with the idea of PP&E. And it's literally an acronym for philosophy, politics, and economics. And it's the idea that those three disciplines should be studied together. There were mm -hmm. interrelationships between them. So it's, an, it's what's now called an interdisciplinary approach to those fields. And in 1986, when James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize, he's what's called a public choice economist. He was a big advocate of the idea that politics and economics or philosophy should be discussed and examined together. So that gave impetus to the beginnings of PP&E programs in America. And thankfully, Duke was one of the leading lights in starting these. There's about 50 of them all over the country now. And uh, but Duke's is a really like, prestigious program, and it's the thought leader. It's headed by Mike Munger, my colleague at at uh, at Duke. We've often had a, a, a co consultation with UNC, which is right nearby. So UNC students are involved in it, and professors are involved in it as well. And it's it's wonderful in the sense that it has this concept of integration, and all the courses we teach uh, have that. So is a, the example I like to give to students in introductory sessions, for example, we started this semester just last week, I say to them, consider the following sentence. We need to enact a fairer tax code. That's a brief sentence, right? But it has PPE in it. All, all PPE &E is in all of it. So I say to them, what part of that is philosophy? And they think for a moment, they say fairer, more just tax code. Taxes is the economics of it, right? The price government imposes on the economy. And we need to enact means we need to legislate. So there's politics behind it. And I, and the theme here is there are so many issues that you could not possibly understand uh, or provide solutions for if you were only studying philosophy or if you were only studying economics or if you were only studying poli sci. So the students who take this are in each of those departments. They have a major... They major in one of those, but they take our PP&E courses to broaden their horizons and see these integrations. That's really the idea behind it. That's great. So um, you get, uh, and you say Duke is the leader in this in yes. this interdisciplinary program. Good. Um, and about 2006, or Munger developed it around 2006 or so and got some other colleagues involved. The standard textbook for PP&E was a joint publication of uh, Duke and UNC. So there's a reader, you know, associated with PP&E where they collected all the classic uh, things from, you know, Aristotle, Locke onward in PP&E. So that's used in other PP&E programs. And and Mike Munger will go around and consult and help other universities set up PP&E programs. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So how, how do your students uh, react to the... Uh... The, the combination of, of, of approaches, like to your initial question. Very favorably. Now, of course, it's a self-selected thing, but we've developed a reputation enough now uh, that they know what they're getting and they hear about it and has a kind of buzz on campus. Mm -hmm. and it, it's not a major, because when you think about it, David, majors are you're specializing in one of these three fields. So it's, it's not a major, it's a what's called a certificate. It's not even a minor but they love it. And it kind of, I, I describe it as kind of turbocharging their major. If an econ student gets the econ major plus a PPE certificate, he's telling the world and he's showing he's had this broader interest, this broader conceptual creative ability. So it tends to attract students like that. And, you know, the students who come in, this is true of any course, if they come in and it's over their head or they don't quite get it, they'll just drop the course. But the numbers have been growing over the years. So Mike and I, you know, monitor it from that standpoint. 
Uh, we help them in terms of, as every professor does, helping them with letters of recommendation, with internships, getting jobs and stuff like that. So we can also track how they do subsequently. And it's it's clear that the ones who have this integration are doing much better in the world uh, than if they were just in one of the majors. Really? By the way, by the way I should say also, if you think about it, David, uh, PPE does not necessarily mean pro-capitalist. Um, I mean, I would name, for example, I would name uh, Marx and Keynes as PPE types. Yeah. You know, in the sense that they talked about philosophy, they talked about politics and economics, but they were left-leaning anti-capitalists. So. So the key point is integration. The key point is uh, the students learn these fields are totally interrelated. And I'm going to know much more about whatever thing I'm studying if I know these three. But but the added benefit of Duke is Mike and I teach both sides. So we teach not only PP&E, we will teach the Marxist, Kate will convey to them the Marxist Keynesian view of PP&E, but then also the, the uh, free market view. Uh, from Adam Smith to, you know, the usual suspects, including Ayn Rand's works, including Buchanan's work, including Mises, Hayek, Bastia. So you get that at Duke in a way you might not in other PPE programs. There's other PPE programs which are totally left wing, but yeah. and that's all they are. But at least they're PPE. At least they're this integration, if you know what I'm getting at. Right. And and I'm I'm curious because I when I was at teaching at Vassar years ago. I taught a political philosophy course, and I taught in terms of uh, broad uh, ideologies, conservatism, socialism, right. classical liberalism, et cetera. And uh, I always felt I did, a, had at the end of the semester, I was always proud when it didn't always happen, but when a student asked me, Mr. Kelly, uh, do, you, do you prefer one of these? They didn't know from my, Right. It was yeah. do, do you uh, strive for that? Something like that? Or do people know? I do. Oh, oh, we definitely we definitely strive for it. I think it, what's more difficult than in the 70s or 80s is they can Google you. Oh, so yeah. that's you, they can Google me or Mike or anyone else and, and almost instantly figure out whether we're pro-capitalist or not. So that's a disadvantage in terms of portraying to them and conveying to them a balanced approach, but I still do a balanced approach in the courses. And now, now some people will think that's like hedging your bets and stuff, but you have to understand in academia today, if you give them a balanced assessment and account of things, they're getting half uh, that they're not getting mo in most other colleges. Another example would be, another example of this is I teach uh, for the fifth year now, I've taught uh, for freshmen, although we call them first years now, uh, capitalism for and against. So it's a seminar for mm -hmm. only uh, limited to 18 students and it sells out every spring capitalism for and against. And I put the, I put the seminar together from scratch five or six years ago and half the readings are trashing capitalism, you know, Marx, Keynes, the environmentalist feminism, and half the readings are pro capitalist. They include conservatives, libertarians, objectivists, and uh, it's totally balanced. And the students come out of that. But many, the, many of the students will joke and say, I never knew there was a case for capitalism. So I took the seminar because apparently there are arguments for, for <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> so um, right. that, is, that is an enormously popular uh, uh, seminar. Um, we started it again last, uh, last week with the sem semester began. And, you know, in the beginning, I go around and I introduce the syllabus and I tell them what the expectations are, the usual professor stuff. But then I also go around and, you know, introduce yourself and uh, where you're from and why you're taking the seminar. And the last student, she said, I'm from China. I've never heard an argument for capitalism. That's why I'm here. Whoa. Yeah. And I thought to myself afterwards, I thought to myself, well, at least China allows her to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, to, you know, first of all, to be in America. And then she found her way into Salzman's seminar. This, you know, her head's going to explode in about three weeks. But. In a, yeah. in a good way. She may not go back. <laughs> I don't know about that. But. You know, I, I, this, I, let me ask you a question that was not on our list, but um, uh, I know some, some people teaching economics uh, have uh, written about using Atlas Shrugged in the classroom because right. it's a novel, it's a story, yep. long one, but... Um, but as a way of conveying things, have you ever done convey things about the, how an economy works and what happens when you intervene in it? Have you ever uh, done that? 
I have done that. I've never assigned the book in its entirety because it's so long and it would take up uh, too much of the seminar. But broad passages from it, including uh, including not just Francisco's money speech. So that is readings in many of my courses and seminars, but uh, also the 20th Century Motor Company, the, the account of when the Starnes took over and adopted uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Now, in that in that case, for example, I juxtapose it to Marx's actual argument in the, I think it was in the Gotha program, where he comes up with that phrase. So first they read Marx making that case, and then they read Ein's uh-huh. 20th Century Motor Company from Atlas. Yeah. And uh, I've also written an essay called Economics and Atlas Shrugged. And that's been republished. That's very been very well received and republished in its chapter in books. So it was originally published, I think, in 2010, The Economics in Atlas Shrugged, where I basically show how knowledgeable Ayn Rand was about economics. And I pick six or seven major themes of what you find in Atlas Shrugged. And then I draw, then I, you know, excerpt it and show it. So I'll, sometimes I'll assign that to students because yeah. it's, it's a concentrated, you know, truncated version of her principles. And that's called the Economics and Atlas Shrugged originally at uh, the Objective Standard, but it's been republished in books uh, on Ayn Rand. So um, there are others like Pete Betke at GMU who have used Atlas Shrugged, who have written essays yeah. about using Atlas Shrugged in the economics classroom. Uh, I, I highly recommend it if you can do it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. Thank you. Um, well, you, you've been highly successful um, in your career in in both uh, chapters of it, banking and academic life. Uh, Do you have any um, advice for younger scholars about who are interested in academic work uh, in terms of preparing for the profession, finding a position, dealing with hostility, cancellations, wokeness, et cetera? You know, this may surprise you, but I'm not sure I do. Partly because of the unorthodox way in which I got here, because I didn't start even considering getting a PhD until my late 40s. So, you know, like in 2012, uh, I mean, I was well into my late 40s or so. So but the standard approach would be, you know, get a good, solid undergraduate degree from a prestigious institution like you went to Princeton you know, and then the next thing is to get into a PhD program and then basically to get a job and try to get tenure and start your career in your 20s. So that when I get students and and Duke is a PhD producing program, it's a research institution. So it's not just the teaching, but publishing. Uh, I do interact with PhD candidates and, and graduate students, and many of them are my TAs. So I do advise them. I do see what they're doing. I do see how they're trying to get jobs. But it's man, it's very difficult. It's most difficult in philosophy department, but I'm in the political science department. It's hard there too. Not hard, not only to get a dissertation completed, but then say, get it published, then get a job. Then once you get the job to get tenure, you know this, David, you succeeded at doing it. It's very difficult to do. And I'm not sure I'm in a position because I haven't been in academia forever, but I have colleagues who have been like Munger has been in it 30 years. So he's very good at advising. And he and I are also conscious of the kind of students who might come to us are those who are, you know, either love free markets or love liberty or love constitution or love America. And that's a minority within the universe, right? So they have special problems of getting in and getting on that the typical PhD candidate wouldn't. So, you know, it's nice for Mike and I to know Liberty Fund and Cato Institute, you know, we try to get people to jobs there. And um, that is one way to do it, but it's very difficult. My broad based advice comes down to literally, I say this a lot, but there's a lot of truth to it. Be a gentleman and a scholar. And gentlemen, of course, I include women. But by that, I mean, you need to be polite in this environment. You need to be collegial. It is called college after all. (laughs) You need to be benevolent. You can't assume. This is especially true for liberty-oriented students. You can't, despite all the sometimes true accounts of how left-leaning academia is, you can't go in there with the expectation that you're going to fail, with the expectation that you're going to be mistreated. It's not easy to do, but you you know what I'm saying? You need to go in there without a chip on your shoulder 
and you can't be battling the man, so to speak. And the scholarship part, of course, is you need to be you need to be smarter, you need to work harder and research better and write better than your competitors who are left leaning because they're already going to be benefited by the fact that they're left leaning. I think this is even more <laughs> difficult in the last, uh, <laughs> last five years, the transition in the last five years toward focusing much more on hiring people on the basis of gender, race, and ethnicity rather than on merit. So it, it's it's especially more difficult, but that's the best advice I can give other than helping them on specific you know, reference letters and contacts and things like that. Mm -hmm. I would say generally, we all know, David, that for some reason, right-leaning conservatives, libertarians, and objectivists tend not to go into academia. And yeah. part, of, part of it might be that they just don't want the hassle. But um, And so the left comes off as, wow, well, we must be more intellectual and we must be more interested in ideas than these conservative yahoos are. That's not true. Some of my best students are conscientiously, you know, on the liberty side, but they never, almost never think of going into academia because they know, they know the reputation. Uh, it's like going into a career where you know you're going to be um, face prejudice. Well, I, that, you know, that's a general issue. Uh, yeah. yeah. How, how do you deal with, uh, and, and tell me what uh, situation is like at Duke. Um, you know, uh, we hear a lot of stories about the uh, the left leaning aspects of, of campus. I mean, to the point of you know, uh, re education camps, so to speak, to use a uh, you know Marxist uh, Chinese term, um, and you know DEI statements you have to fill out. How before you get hired, you have, when you apply, you have to say you know what have I done for yeah. diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and so, and Duke was one of the, had, at least at a while back, had a reputation for being one of the worst, maybe under Stanley Fish when he was there. Um, I mean, you remember his book, uh, There's No Such Thing as Free Speech, and and it's a good good thing, something like that. I mean, he was just frank about his uh, yeah. uh, postmodernism. Yeah. Uh, so, he, but tell me, tell us about your context and how, how, if at all, that impacts your work well, at the uh, position at Duke. I am aware of that history, and there are, you know, measures to this day. There are groups that uh, kind of grade the universities on openness and uh, free speech codes and things like that. It's called FIRE, F-I-R-E. It's an acronym for, I forget, but. Uh, and Duke does get good grades now, whether they would have in the 80s and 90s, the period you're talking about, where there was a postmodern, they were advancing postmodernism. Uh, I don't know, but and, and it's hard for me being there and being at the PPE program, being with Mike, and we're not the only ones. I would say, I would say, in econ and poli sci, there are sixty professors, and probably ten percent or fifteen percent of us are uh, liberals. Uh, liberals in the good sense, in the name, yeah. in the, you know, pro prioritizing liberty above all. Uh, now, that's a small percentage, but it's not a zero percentage. And in some university departments, it's almost zero. So uh, I think Duke is more, I don't know if you want to call it ecumenical and uh, fair in that regard. They are not preventing the students from getting uh, all sides of the argument. But and, and then the student, I, I actually face the issue of if the students uh, come to me or Mike or somebody else with, uh, you know, a right leaning approach and thinking they're going to get a benefit. I tell them, no, 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 we're not here to uh, pamper you or help you get through. You need to work harder. You, you need to be more disciplined and work harder than your compatriots. And uh, and so and, you know, we kind of saying, you know, the other side is actually treated badly. And they'll say, what do you mean? I said, because they're given a pass. They're not really challenged. So they'll go in as lefties. They'll come out as lefties and they've never changed. But you come in and you need both. You, you need to understand both sides and argue both sides. You're going to be a much more fully developed human being, uh, you know, able to withstand the, the, the arrows and slings that are coming at you uh, in whatever profession you enter. So that's kind of the way we, 
we pitch it. By the way, David, uh, you know this from academia, but I think it's been a very funny trend. If you go back enough decades, the Marxists hung out in the uh, economics department. And then, then when they were showed to be buffoons, they uh, headed over to the poli sci department. But then when they were uh, shown to be buffoons in poli sci, they went over to the sociology department. And then even there, they were found out and they went over to the literature department. I mean, that's where Stanley Fish was, right? And I've always thought this is a perfect uh, proper migration for the Marxists because they ended up uh, in fiction, uh, not in uh, nonfiction. So that's true to this day. You don't really see full-fledged Marxists or uh, I would say even rabid Keynesians in the economics department uh, and not just Duke. I mean, everywhere. I think Amherst, Massachusetts is the lone holdout. UMass Amherst is almost all Marxists. But um, they don't really exist in uh, P, P, and E anymore. They exist in these more marginal fields like literature and English and stuff like that, where the postmoderns hang out. You're muted, David. Um, it's kind of the opposite of a phenomenon I've noticed, which is, uh, I call it uh, rigor envy. Um, yeah. Yeah. That... Uh, uh, People in the social sciences look up to economics because they actually have data and math. Um, and people yeah. in literature look uh, and religion look up to philosophy because we have logic. And right, yeah. philosophers look up to math because right. they got the, the yeah. peak uh, of rigor. Yeah. So this is kind of the opposite of, you know, moving down that chain. Yeah. <laughs> of yeah. these rigorous fields. Anyway, um, you know, oh, I, the other, the, I have to say the other thing I benefited by, people often ask me, if you're an economist, why are you in poli sci? That Duke and others, the poli sci departments would increasingly take in economists. So so Mike Munger, for example, I hate to keep bringing up Mike, I don't want to embarrass him in any way, uh, got his PhD in economics under Doug North, who's a Nobel Prize laureate. Wow. Uh, and and it, But this was a trend also after Buchanan got the Nobel Prize in 86. He was an economist, but you know, a PP&E guy. The poli sci departments, and thankfully Duke did this as well, realized that to get more vigor and rigor both into poli sci, it was better often to hire economists. And in the public choice school, which Buchanan was the father of basically him and Tulloch, the public choice school, the whole point of it was to bring economic analysis and tools to bear to study right. politicians, not just to study business people, that would be economic, but they brought it in to say, well, government activity can be analyze this way rigorously, assume self-interest, assume politicians are self-interested, not these uh, altruist, you know, angels. And um, it was, a, it, it totally transformed many political science departments. So that's one of the reasons um, someone like me or others can succeed in, in academia and in poli sci, because we're experts in that and not many people are. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, I, I want to touch on a couple of economic issues. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest I'm seeing in the chat box, even though we're not um, opening it up uh, to questions per se, but um, you know, you've, you've written about a, a wide range of economic issues uh, and including your thesis at Duke was about um, debt, government uh, deficit financing, government yes. borrowing. Right. Um, so, could you give us a kind of quick sketch of the state of things today and how debt borrowing connects with economics? And of course, I, I know I'm throwing a huge question at you, so. <laughs> That's okay. I would put it this way. Um, my theme of the last decade or so has been, by the way, it helped that I was in banking and finance and investments because they knew bonds inside and out. I mean, a lot of people specialize in stocks, and this is a technical issue, but bond financing uh, is basically borrowing in a formalized way. And then, of course, governments do it. They issue government bonds, right? So first of all, I had this technical background, interest rates and duration and debt ratios and default, and I knew all the techniques ground up, so to speak. Now, and then applying that to what I knew about governments, here's been my theme when the welfare state grows, and we know it has been, and we know there's a philosophic reason for this, but setting that aside, when it grows beyond uh, sustainable proportions in a democratic setting, uh, politicians cannot tax people enough because they'll get thrown out of office. There are tax revolts. 
you know, the California ones of the late 70s, people remember in Reaganomics in a way, the Reagan revolution was, you know, lower tax rates. So, um, but if they're not questioning the spending and they're, uh, you know, not raising the taxes, the only, way to, the only other way to fund this is to borrow. So government can only tax, borrow, or here's the worst part, print money. Those are the three ways it finances itself. So one of the reasons this is a hot topic, I think is a hot topic and why I have something of value to add to it is we're in this period and have been at least since we went off the gold standard 50 years ago, where government, the welfare state is growing. And I would add the warfare state too, if you want to put it that way as well. Uh, very costly foreign adventures and wars. It's not fundable on taxes alone. So there's a greater resort to borrowing. And then the problem is that the government borrows too much, the interest rates will go up. So then it turns to the central bank and says, will you please buy these bonds for us? Because we can't get the market to do it. It's kind of technical here. I don't want to get into the weeds, but this is one of the reasons why the central banks now uh, feel pressured to print money. Because the only way to buy government bonds is to print money. The Federal Reserve doesn't have independent wealth. So you get inflation. So that's a mouthful, but I specialize in uh, public finance. And public finance is the financing of government. And of course, it has to start with how much is it spending to begin with and why? And so my analysis is, um, why do they borrow? Why do they sometimes borrow too much? Why do they sometimes default? A whole bunch of issues on defaulting government mm -hmm. debt, that's an issue. And why do they resort to the printing presses when they can't borrow any further? So that's the that's the view from 30,000 feet. And we can talk about, I mean, US debt, for example, now is 32 trillion it's hard to put these numbers in context, but it's now more than the annual GDP. And that hasn't happened since World War II. The World War II, wars themselves are known for massive deficit spending. But here, effectively, we have massive deficit spending in peacetime. And it's due to the welfare state. It's not really due to war so much as to the welfare state. And uh, that's really problematic. So... Um, so anyway, that's we know that inflation has risen recently as well. So that's on people's minds. That hadn't happened since, uh, not to this degree at least, since the 70s. So uh, so there's a lot to say on this, but I'll stop there. All right, thank you. So um, I know you. I, if, if we did get into the weeds, which you don't have time for, uh, I know that you have uh, some different views about the connection between uh, uh, the money supply, inflation, and recession, interest rates in a recession, and so forth. Um, but I really, um, in the 15 minutes or so that we have left, I really want to get into objectivism. Okay, uh, I asked you about out the shrug before, but um, yeah. uh, tell us uh, when and uh, when you discovered objectivism and how. Again, that was in uh, halfway through college, so I was uh, 20. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. 1979 or so. And it was Capitalism, the Un Unknown Ideal. That was my first book. Uh, so I started with the nonfiction. And by the way, the chapter in that book that most influenced me, mostly due to my upbringing, being in a, in a Catholic conservative family, was conservatism and obituary. Uh, because because at the dinner table, while the crazies were going on in the 1960s, and, and we were actually living in a Chicago suburb in 1968 during the Democratic Convention, <laughs> I remember asking my father, because uh, he was a conservative, and he would be, you know, pro-Nixon, and he would be against the hippies and against the uh, riots and, and, and <laughs> Vietnam. And I think at one point I said to him, why are we losing if the arguments are so good? And he didn't really have an answer. <laughs> I think he, I think he said something about people are rotten or something. You know, I don't, I forget. I adore my father, so I don't want to. I don't want to speak ill of him. But, um, but so well, you know, if you read that essay, Ayn Rand has three reasons why conservatives aren't very good at defending capitalism. I mean, part of it is they base it on tradition or backward looking, you know, mere tradition or faith. And the third one was the one that sounded like my father. People are just rotten. You know, they they are dumb or they can't get the argument. Um, and certainly in conservative circles, there's a suspicion, of course, of egoism, of self-interest, of the pursuit of happiness. It just yeah. sounds too secular. It just sounds too selfish. And and uh, so that was an eye opener to me because here's Ayn Rand saying there is a defense of capitalism, but the conservatives aren't going to give it to you. Um, one of the things I love about the Atlas Society is we do have outreach to other groups that aren't objectivists. We're not just, you know, we're not preaching to the converted. 
we're trying to teach the perverted. I don't, I don't mean that we're teaching perverts. I mean, I mean, we're trying to teach people who, whose views have been perverted by, uh, you know, anti-capitalist prejudices and biases and stuff like that. So, so you do need to know, well, what are the conservatives arguing? I mean, if they're trying, okay, at least they're trying, what are the libertarians arguing for capitalism and what are their weaknesses? And let's uh, give them better arguments. I know you've been a big part of, I mean, you have been the champion of that for years and actually very good at it. I'm late to the game, I think. But but back to the original point, that essay really influenced me. Uh, the idea of, um, it's one thing to have enemies of capitalism, but if you have allies who are weak, that could be almost more treacherous yeah. than outright en enemies. That's a real phenomenon in ideological life, not just in objectivism, but... Um, <laughs> Our, yeah. our severest uh, criticisms are, you know, directed at our brothers and sisters, not our distant relatives, like or the right. their opposites, like. Right. Yeah. But uh, how about Ren's novels? Did you go on well, to read them? I read them all, and my uh, I'm trying to think in what order I read them. I pretty I think I knew that she had done sequentially We the Living Fountainhead and Atlas, so I read them in that order. I was very, I was marching through the works, so to speak, <laughs> but my absolute favorite was Atlas. And I think I'm glad I read him in that order because I think if I had read Atlas first, it might've been too much for me. Although, you know, I was, by then I was in my early twenties. The first time I went to an objectivist conference and thankfully I met you, this is, this will date us, David, <laughs> but uh, it, it was almost 40 years ago, my gosh, in 1985 at uh, La Jolla at the university. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I think you were definitely on the program. Uh, but so by then I was only, I was 25 or 26 years old then. And I'd already read most of the work. I'd actually in 83 taken Understanding Objectivism, a live course by Leonard Peikoff in uh, the Roosevelt Hotel in New York. So that was an eye opener just to meet Leonard for the first time and see that course was particularly geared to people who had misused and misunderstood objectivism and treated it like dogma and browbeat others into it. And um, I was, I think, beginning to be that way. And so that was an eye opener to take this course and say, you know, this is really the proper way to understand objectivism. Yeah. We could talk about whether that, how well that persisted. Um, right, agreed, but, it didn't, right. Um, but you have, uh, you've been involved at uh, not going into the, um, into some of those things. Um, you've been involved in, um, a great many objectivist organizations, activities. You published in um, various journals, including uh, on our website. Um, so you have a, a pretty broad sense of the the variety, internal varieties among or differences among objectivist groups. Yeah. But um, but also a pretty broad sense of of you know what the movement as such looks like. Do you have, have anything to, um, any ideas about, you know, the future of the movement, how, how, whether we can succeed, how we can succeed? I do. I am optimistic uh, and uh, I think also realistic, which is the optimism should be based on realism. The the word movement is interesting to me because I look as I look at the wide scope of things, it's it seems undeniable to me that the movement really moved in the 60s. I mean, it was really moving. She had published these books, and now she was in demand on campuses, and she was getting all sorts of media coverage, and all the way up until the time she died in 1982. Now she was on Phil Donahue, now she was on Tom Snyder's Tomorrow Show. Obje other objectivists were getting their PhDs. I, I mean, I think it really, you, including you, you were succeeding. You were an example of people succeeding in prestigious universities. And for a long time, objectivists didn't really have that. You were the first one. Others really couldn't get jobs uh, for various reasons. But, and, and so I, sadly, I think the movement isn't moving as much since then. And it's had its ups and downs that it's had its, um, momentum and not but uh why so why am i saying all that why am i and of course schisms over the years have vivisected the movement and slowed it down for that reason alone whereas if there had been collegiality maybe there would have been a stronger movement and and by the way i just define movement as are you seeing 
the broader culture being influenced by objectivist intellectuals? Are you seeing objectivist intellectuals getting good positions in prominent publications and uh, universities yeah. and things like that? So we, I think we agree on the definition of that. And uh, you can look at the numbers and they're just not as stellar as they should be, I think, at this point. Uh, now, why am I optimistic? I, I think I'm optimistic actually because there are varieties of, of approaches now. I wouldn't put it as varieties of objectivism. I do not believe, you know, the, not to name names, but, you know, the argument that certain people aren't really doing objectivism. No, we all know there are three main groups right now, and I'm so proud to be involved with you, David, and the Atlas Society, and I'm involved because I think you're doing it absolutely the right way. And it's fun and it's intellectually challenging. And, um, and so I'm optimistic because this approach is more of an approach that's, uh, uh, call it cosmopolitan, call it, call it outreach, call mm -hmm. it a, 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 a concerted attempt to reach out to those who are close to us uh, and can be, con con I hate to use the word converted, but convinced by us that they need a solid philosophic <laughs> moral argument for capitalism. I I, th I really think some of the environmentalists and uh, Marxists are just too far gone, that they're just not open to the ideas. Yeah. But there's a huge universe. And other groups are, you know, other objectivist groups, uh, not to name names, but are, are more insular. They're talking to each other. They all agree with each other. They're uh, preaching to the converted, as we say. And uh, I think, uh, interestingly, the kind of objectivist today who, if you want to challenge yourself, learn the philosophy, and be able to explicate it to others who don't necessarily agree with you, our approach is the approach. Now, the other approach, in a way, is easier. Like, if you become an, we know this, David, you and I have both done this, if you become an expert in objectivism, and then speak to only objectivist groups, they love you. Of course, they love you. They applaud, and there's no pushback, and and, and it's all, uh, you know, like mutual admiration society, which is fine, but it's, uh, it's almost too easy. It's almost the easy way to go, you know, to become so expert in something that nobody else knows uh, how to challenge you on it. But um, so it's so uh, I'm I'm not of the view that to have two or three, and maybe more to come, objectivist groups is a bad thing for the movement. I think it's a good thing because it's uh, like competition. Uh, you know, let the best approach win. Yeah. And uh, there's another group, again, I won't name, I don't, I hate to name names here because I'm so pro Atlas Society, but you know, there's another group that's doing interesting stuff on what I call lifestyle objectivism. So they're not, they're not posing as objectivists to, you know, experts and doing exegesis on the text. They're applying objectivism to your, your, your daily life, your career choices, your entrepreneurial skills, your love of art, your love of travel. And, stuff. and there's a place for that too. I mean, Ayn said, uh, objectivism is a philosophy for living on earth. That's really bringing it to the issue. Hey, the point here is to enjoy your life. And if philosophy can, and and it does help you do that, um, that group is taking it in that direction, which is fine. So, but I love working with you, David, and I love the approach of the Atlas Society. It's, uh, it's outreach and it's benevolent and it's still very rigorously uh, scrupulous about objectivism. But it, it, you know, as you put at one point, is this the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I mean, the philosophy, um, there's a lot of truth in it, but it's not the whole truth. And if it's going to be, a, I, I want to hear more from you on this than from me, but if it's going to be a growing living movement, uh, movement means move, move, grow. Uh, this approach, this approach is going to be better. Other becomes dead and desiccated. Right. And so what do you, yeah. you tell me, you tell me, I want to hear from you. Well, that the idea of the, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, is a great, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing that you swear to in a law court. Right. Because the right. whole truth there right. is uh, the whole truth of what you know about this situation. But uh, it's a bad epistemology, uh, epistemological principle, because, I, yeah, the truth, yes, that's our goal. We want to seek it. And nothing but the truth, you know, no lies, no falsifications, no errors. Right. Absolutely. But the whole truth, come on, we're not omniscient. Um, right. I, if I thought objectivism had the whole truth, um, I would have, I would not have been interested in being a philosopher. I, you know, I never understood when, when the issue came up, when I actually defined the closed versus open issue, I, I thought, I, I don't get it. If it were closed, why would anyone 
be doing, you know, philosophical work. Other right, and, and right. And uh, full disclosure, when this debate first uh, surfaced in the late 80s, I didn't get it. I, I believed in closed objectivism. And I believed in this garbage about, well, if anyone is trying to extend the philosophy, apply the philosophy in new areas, if necessary, correct errors in the philosophy. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> that, that, was some, that that was somehow fraudulent. That's not true. I, I only regret that it took me so long to get there. But um, for those of you listening who have no idea what we're talking about, if you go to the Atlas Society and just put in closed versus open objectivism, Dave is a pioneer in this, and he has advocated the open position, but it has nothing to do with a fraudulent presentation of objectivism. I think it has to do with a fair, honest, gentlemanly, scholarly, benevolent way of growing and extending this philosophy, not just the content of it, uh, but the uh, listeners of it, or the call, if call it what you will, followers of it. By the way, another pitch, David, I interviewed you in this format. <laughs> so make sure people also, I interviewed David <laughs> in the same kind of format. So that's, I, it might've been a year, was it a year ago? Uh, it's uh, last April. So that's very illuminating. I love that interview. You were great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and speaking, we do have a few minutes left. Speaking of... Uh, you know, open and closed, uh, you you have some uh, issues where you've differed from at least standard objectivist views over the years uh, on economics. I, I think they're mostly applications, but tell us some of, some of the ones that... Um, yeah, they, good, yeah, they are applications, and they're not really, you know, me questioning the fundamentals of objectivism. I, but uh, it's been interesting to me because even in applications and differing applications, and and you you know within the Atlas Society, Rob Trzinski and I differed on uh, Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't consider this uh, you know questioning objectivism, but it has been interesting to me because on on fairly big issues of application, when I've differed, the the pushback I've gotten from objectivism is really surprisingly negative. Uh, but anyway, so so just as some examples. In the early 90s, I gave a series of six lectures on the philosophy of the Austrian school. Now, up until then, Mises, not Hayek, but Mises and, the, and Hazlitt and others had been pushed by objectivism. And I do consider Hazlitt and Mises as really stellar economists. But objectivists did not know how bad their underlying philosophy was. Um, praxeology and a priori deduction. Mises was a Kantian in method. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not so much nitpicking, but I found that it affected his economics in some way. For example, the passivity of his uh, uh, Kantian approach gave him no theory of the entrepreneur. So, I mean, it showed, it showed up in some of his economics. But anyway, that was, I mean, that was at an objectivist conference. It was Ocon in 94, but there was a lot of pushback. Like, why are you criticizing the Austrians? You know, something like that. Now, the, the, wow. at, the, at the same time, I was learning about Jean-Baptiste Say, famous for Say's Law, and actually the father of what will become supply-side economics in the 80s. So I became a scholar of Say, and I still am to this day, Jean-Baptiste Say. So within the objectivist movement, I was making a case for, you guys really need to study Jean-Baptiste Say. But the objectivists would say something like, did Ayn Rand ever say anything about Jean-Baptiste Say? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, they would, David. And I'd say, no. And they would say, was he recommended at the back of capitalism then on ideal? No. So why are we, you know, that kind of stuff. And Say is amazing. Say is great. Another one, another one, you know, I disagreed with her view on women can't be or shouldn't be president. Yeah. And, and so I would say, wow, even before she died, Thatcher was in office. Thatcher won in 1979. Ayn died in 1982. I, I've scoured the record. I can't say I see Ayn saying anything nice about Margaret Thatcher. That's surprising to me. It's amazing to me considering how now she couldn't have known that Thatcher would transform Britain over the next 10 years as she might not have known about Reagan. But again, that surprised me. You might have thought another one was I was a defender of, from the beginning of Reagan and then of supply side economics. And in the objectivist movement, Reagan was the devil. I mean, Leonard Anine, while he was running even in 76 and afterwards said he was absolutely the devil. Don't vote for him. Vote for his opposite. So all through the 80s, I got pushed back from objectivists. Why are you defending Reagan? Why are you defending Reaganomics? Why are you defending supply side? Why are you defending Art Laffer and the supply side? And by the time the Soviet Union fell, they weren't even willing, Peter Schwartz and others, weren't, weren't even willing to admit that Reagan's policies had anything to do with it, which struck me as kind of dishonest. 
We also disagreed about Greenspan. I was a critic of Greenspan almost from the beginning. I thought he was kind of fraudulent once he got to Washington. I loved his essays from the 60s. Yeah. Golden economic freedom really influenced me. I love that. But um, and for many years, objectivists had the view that Greenspan was this kind of inside mole, you know, preventing us from becoming, cap, uh, you know, totally socialist. But his sellout at the end was obvious uh, to most. The last one was, the last most controversial one was when I was doing the public finance research on my dissertation and going through the history of it and studying more closely Alexander Hamilton, who put together American wow. finance and fixed American finances, as you know, in the 1970s, 1790s, I, I, t I totally dove into it, all things Hamilton, not just his political economy, but the Federalist Papers and all that, his history. And this was before Hamilton the musical, <laughs> to way before that. Uh, I was surprised that Hamilton the musical was was as popular as it was. But if you know, in objectivist circles and in libertarian circles, Hamilton is the devil. I mean, they consider him a proto-statist. They consider him a mercantilist, a free a central banker. And, and I found the opposite. I found Alexander Hamilton in his time, way before his time, to be the most pro-capitalist founder. So I, I started, I published on this more recently in 2017, I published something called uh, America at her best is Hamiltonian. And uh, that's controversial because uh, Jefferson is the star among yeah. most, uh, as you know, most among most. So those are just examples of over 30 years, me just researching something and coming to a different conclusion and getting some pushback from objectivists, not from all of them. There are many objectivists who said, you make a good point here. These people are decent. These people are good. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. And uh, we need to wrap. So I'm going to uh, uh, have to sadly wrap it up. Um, we can, um, I, I know some people would be interested in um, checking out your, uh, where, the, where to find more of your writings. And I think uh, we have that in the chat box. Um, Great. You have a, uh, uh, a www.richardsalsman.com will yeah. get you almost everywhere. Right. So thank you, Richard. This has been a great conversation, uh, illuminating for me, lots of fun. Good. I want to yeah. thank all, everyone for joining us today. Um, and just say, if you enjoyed this video, uh, this session or the video, if you're watching it later, or any of our other materials, please consider supporting the Atlas Society with a... Uh, nonprofit donation. And be sure to tune in next week when Jennifer Grossman, our CEO, will be interviewing Peter Worrell on the Atlas Society Asks. That will be the next installment. So look to our website for news about that. Thank you, Richard, again. David, uh, thank you. David, thank you. It's been an honor to be interviewed by you. Truly well, an honor. Thank you so much, my friend. Mutual, mutual feeling. Okay. Great. Bye. All right. So 